Baptist Church, as you're with us here or watching online, we welcome you. And we're glad you're here to praise God with us in this church. With you, hopefully in person, you have your bulletin to follow along. And if you're watching us online this morning, you can go to mumcnc.com and you'll find church information. If you press the Pentecost tab, you'll find at the very bottom of the page, bulletins, children's bulletins, and music. We hope you'll join along with us as we worship together as one congregation and one body of Christ. Let us be called to worship. Are there people who have influenced your life in negative ways? There are people who only want to see the sorrow and sadness. Are there people who have, have tired to bring you despair, have tried to bring you despair? There are people so entrapped in their own misery that they cannot think of other ways. Come to the Lord, whose brightness and truth will give you new light and insight. Bring us to your light, Lord Jesus, that we may be strengthened who withstand the darkness and bring light to others. Amen. We stand and join us today in singing our opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
This is our time of prayer, and if you're watching with us, or even if you're here in our sanctuary, if you have a prayer request, we ask that you write them on your bulletin and place them in the offering plate so we can be in prayer for you. If you're online, just place them in the comments, and we have a faithful prayer community, and we want to be in prayer for the needs that are here. But let us begin first with a time of silent prayer. Whatever is on your mind this morning, lift it up to God. So let us pray. and mighty God, we are so thankful to be in your presence this morning, that we can not only do this just on Sunday, but we can do it every day of the week, that we can rise and praise you and know that you're walking with us through the day. Lord, let us depend on you more rather than the things that we have in our lives, rather than the things that pull us this way or that. Let us focus on you. And Lord, as we lift up prayer concerns that we may be aware of and may not, we ask that you be with those people, those places, those things that we're in prayer for, that your mighty hand be upon them, that you offer a healing touch for those who might need a touch of, of just peace and kindness and love in their lives. May you be a healing presence in those who are recovering from surgery or going through treatment. May you be there for those who may not even be aware that they are walking in a place that's dangerous to themselves and to others. Be a constant presence in our lives. Help us to feel and make us aware of the moments when you are truly entering into to our world and to our lives and bringing about light instead of darkness. Lord, we ask all of this and all the things that we have shared in our silent prayers we lift up to you to this day, knowing and depending on you, putting our faith and trust in you who leads the way as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pastor Tracy and I switched Sundays for the children's sermon. She'll be doing it next week. I'm Tim Eves, and this is the children's sermon. If you have children, come on down. Are you? Want to come down? Lucy, you over here. And if you're watching in line, uh, we, I have a. Well, today I want to talk to you about a book in the Bible. And it's about a man named Job. And uh, I'm going to talk to you for about two minutes, and then I have an object lesson that I hope you understand it. Thank you. Even better. Uh, Job was a good man. He was a successful man. He was a wealthy man. And he loved God. And he worshiped God. And he tried to follow God and, and do the right thing all the time. But Job started having some terrible problems and trials in his life. Um, he, one day, he had seven sons and three daughters. And one day, they were all killed, all at the same time. 
And that same day, Job, Job also had lots of land. He had thousands of donkeys and sheep and, and, uh, and camels too, yeah. And, uh, and that same day, all of them were killed at the same time. Then later on, he started having sores all over his body from the top of his head to his toes. His health was miserable. He had no idea what was going on. Why was God allowing these things to happen to him? What was, what was he going to do? His wife and several other people tried to get him to turn away from God, to stop believing in God, stop trusting God. But Job, he never cursed God. He never turned from God. He believed in God, and he and he, he, he did question God, and he cried about the things that were happening to him. But he never, never lost trust of God and never cursed God. Because Job believed that God had a purpose and a plan for his life. And in the end of everything, God took all his sores away. God poured money into his land, into his home. God, uh, God gave him children again. And God made everything right. Job uh, knew that if he trusted through God, trusted God through all the problems that he had, and he believed that God had a purpose for his life, God would see him through any problem to the other side, which is the point of this whole lesson. God will see you through on the other side. So here's the object lesson that I'm going to tell you about. I'll show you. I'm going to have to put this microphone down. Right, that we have, may have in our lives. It represents things that, that we're, we're afraid of, things that, that hurt us, things that make us cry at night, and, and things we don't we get frustrated with. But you know, there's things that are not frustrating to God, because God, we know that God has a purpose for everything, and He will, he will see us through, and, and uh, He'll see us through the other side, okay? These pencils, represent our lives and remember he said that God would take us through our problems and see us on the other side. Now if I were to take the pencil and stab it in there and pull it out you think it would make a mess all in the floor? Oh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But, but we're not supposed to abandon God in the middle of our problems we're supposed to trust God and, and know that He will see us through it. So watch this. Watch girls. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Look. The pencil went all the way through. Wow. Now, it, it's, it just shows you that, like I said, God does not want us to pull back when you're going through problems. He, he, wants, he wants to say, God, I can't trust you through this. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I just can't, can't trust you anymore. He wants us to say, God, I trust you. Oh. And he wants to say, Lord, I trust you no matter how hard it is, no matter how miserable it is, or no matter what we're going through, I know you're going to see us on the other side. So what? I hope this works too. I'm going to try again. God will trust us on the other side in everything we are. Yes. Will you pray, pray with me, please? Father God, help us to trust, help us to trust you. Trust that you will be with us and help us through our problems and always see us on the other side. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Sorry about that.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Job. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to that page. It's Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, and then we jump from 10 to 17. <coughs> then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to his brother, him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the later days of Job, more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemiah, the second Kizieh, 
the third, Hanuk. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of the days. May God bless the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Before we delve into the sermon this week, um, I think we want to just acknowledge that we know maybe the rest of Job have heard that story and what Job's journey has been. It was not an easy one. And that those in his lives came from different perspectives to what was going on. One of the main groups that came to different perspectives were his friends. You remember Job's friends? They weren't always the most supportive, but they were there. <laughs> Job's life completely fell apart. Poverty, wealth, the family taken one by one, Job's health, Job's wife doesn't respond very well to all of this, not for a lack of perspective. And then there's Job's friends. At first response, they try in their best way possible to offer some care. Not for a lack of anything that may be going on in their own lives, but they're trying to respond, and so they just sit in him with him in silence. The ministry of presence. They just say, here we are, and they let Job mourn. But after a while, and maybe you've been around someone as well, that when Job's complaints got louder and louder, his friends lose their perspective. After all, to them, the storm cloud has moved off. The major incident of his life maybe has moved away. It's some distance away from them, but it's still right overhead for Job. So they start pointing fingers at Job. They start assigning fault. And in the end, they make Job angry. I'm sure you've never been in that kind of spot with friends. Someone's hurting, maybe even you or me, and well-meaning friends start giving advice. Giving advice isn't bad in itself, right? Maybe it's not quite the right approach in some circumstances, but sometimes we just give bad advice. <laughs> or we have that perspective of, it's time for you to stop crying, just get over it, it's over. I remember the phrase when I was little, just rub some dirt in it. To tell someone when the cloud is overhead and continues to be overhead in their life, that is no big deal. And just get over it is it's just not too helpful. See, it's just not helpful. I mean, see? It, <laughs> Grief, things that we lose in life, take time. And we work in different ways as different people through that. And during this time, even we have lost much. Some have lost connection. Some have lost friends and family. Some have lost that way of normalcy. We've lost. We may have some, some of these identifying sufferings of Job. But I really want to be helpful. Beyond the ministry of presence, we need to start offering some baby steps. Have you ever heard of baby steps? Okay. I mean, pop culture is full of references to baby steps. There was a sign I saw um, when I was on vacation. It said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step from St. Francis. And how about the famous story of eating an elephant? Well, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. <laughs> and then there's the movie, What About Bob? And this pop psychology concept of a new level. And there's a really funny scene where 
the, the therapist is saying he wants him to read his new book, Baby Steps, and he starts baby stepping all over the office. But basically what he's trying to say in is don't eat the elephant at the same time. You know, try to eat the whole elephant at once. Just take the first bite. Don't worry about making the whole thousand mile journey. Just worry about the first step. Baby steps out the door, baby steps out the office, baby steps to the elevator <coughs> in the middle. Of course, um, these are self-help kind of statements and when that cloud is looming over you, everything seems like a gigantic task. Everything you do just seems overwhelming. I mean, that's why staying in bed seems so appealing. Because all we have to do is pull the covers over our head and maybe that dark cloud won't seem so dark. And sometimes maybe that's not half bad that we want to stay in bed and under the covers. But that can't be a long-term solution for any of us. At some point, we're going to have to take that first step toward recovery, toward renewal. Whether the first step is something like helping someone else, or maybe even a smaller step would just be simply taking a shower. Cleaning yourself up. Getting out of the house. These baby steps can help us get back on the road of recovery and renewal and hope. But I'm not here today to just tell you some self-help tips. <laughs> That's not why you came here today to go, Tracy's going to provide me with some self-help today and I can leave with the book the therapist wrote, Baby Steps. No. I mean, I hope that what I'm sharing is helpful, but there's not really much to that. But we want to kind of put it in the perspective of specifically a Christian perspective. And so while that may be good advice and might provide some good motivation, my job is not to be a motivational speaker. And I hope you leave today, yes, with some baby steps, but with something bigger. Because I think baby steps do something more than just provide an easy answer. I think they are a symbol of hope. When we look deeper into the passage from Job, we meet a different Job than we've seen in a while. He's not rich and righteous. He's not loud and complaining. In this particular passage, at the end of Job, we see a Job that is humbled. God was trying to show Job a different perspective. Job didn't get a specific answer to his complaint, but instead he encountered God's presence along this way. After seeing God in fullness as creator and sustainer of the world, Job takes a different perspective than he had before at the beginning of Job. I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me. Our text says that Job despises himself and repents in dust and ashes. And that's really not the best translation. I think a better translation is, given the context of our day, might be this. I will be quiet, comforted that I am dust. The author is using common metaphors to show Job's new perspective. It would be easy to take this translation and we have to say that Job is more depressed, or he's most sad, or that things are still not going right. But scholars actually say quite the contrary. After this experience with God, Job is comforted in humility. Now how do we know Job is comforted? We can see it in his baby steps, literally. And it's important to note Job's restoration does not seem instantaneous. But it's a lifelong process with full participation by Job. Job. God is not some magical, you know, I'll give you this and this and this for Job. In verses 10 through 17, a lot of people are working. The Lord restores fortunes, brothers and sisters. 
And the first time we see Job at work is in verse 13. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Now I think as a lot of scholars do that this is the most profound response Job could make. I mean, let's put yourself in his place. All the kids that he had had previously are gone. They've been taken away. He faced unimaginable pain. And those of you who may have been affected by a loss may understand. One of the hardest things he could have done was to bring more children into the cruel world that he had been exposed to. Ellen Davis, which is a brilliant Old Testament scholar, compared it to Holocaust survivors having children and called it the most courageous act of faith Jews have ever performed. Bringing defenseless children into a world of pain and suffering is a huge symbol of hope. Job's most profound step into restoration is not the increase in sheep or camels, it's having children. Perhaps the hardest thing to have when you are sad, when you are experienced loss, when you feel like that big cloud is over you, is having hope. Hope will always be confronted with pain. Hope is that those storm clouds will clear. Hope is that the sun will rise again. And that's not just when we're sad or when things are overwhelming. When we watch the news, <coughs> as we see all of those things happening and, you know, violence and, and us not getting along and all those things close to home, when it's hard to see that our lives will flourish again, that peace is possible in our lives through hope. One word can be the hardest word for us to say we're in the middle of all that pain and suffering. There's just three little word, letters, just three letters that can make such a profound difference in our outlook. And that word is, anybody guess it? It's three letters. <laughs> But, but, it's not what you'll carry with you, the kind that contrasts one thing to another. My uncle used to say, well, my, my dad and those who played golf and, and others in my life used to say when they played golf that they needed more but statements. <laughs> Anytime he said, man, that was a horrible shot. Or shoot, I hit that into the woods again. You need to add a but statement. <laughs> Take negatives, but I hit that and I made a bar or something. Take negatives and turn them into positives. Take something bad and add a little hope. You can see this but statement. I know that sounds very, sounds very weird to say that in church all the time, but <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> We see this but statement in a lot of songs of lament in scripture. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but even in the darkest times when suffering overwhelms, God is still on the throne. There is always hope, even when we can't see it through our pain. I want to go back to a, a person in, in Mark, Bartimaeus. Do you remember Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus was blind. He needed some healing. And Jesus said to him, your faith has made you well. But that's not when he gets up and goes to Jesus. Bartimaeus' healing begins when he hears that Jesus is coming to town. Mark tells us that he began to shout out to Jesus for mercy. He knew that Jesus could heal him, and that offered him hope that he would see again. When Jesus saw the hope within Bartimaeus, he knew his faith was strong. And as he said, your faith has made you well, 
your hope has given you sight. I love that. I love that Bartimaeus, that his first step was simply hearing about Jesus. And then he took another step and he went to see Jesus. And then he took another step and he asked Jesus to heal him. Some of you may be watching today and are here today because you are blinded by the problems in your lives. They are so overwhelming that your pain just feels like it overwhelms any hope in your life. That hope seems a thousand miles away, maybe. And you don't need people to tell you to get over it. You don't need maybe even of my self-help kind of suggestions. You don't need pop psychology. What you need is hope. And I have great news for you today. Hope is present because God is present. Because Jesus is present. Hope is here because Christ walks with us just as he did with Bartimaeus. And the fact that you even heard about Jesus is already infusing hope in your life. I'm not asking you to get better now. I'm not saying you'll walk out of here and everything will be great, the cloud will be dismissed, and you'll be on your way down the real brick road. All I want you to know today is that a new day is coming. I hope you add hope to the end of your lament, that you see light at the end of your darkness. That when you cry out in pain and say, but I know that you are with me, God, that is more than just a baby step. It is a symbol of hope, a symbol of faith. It is part of the restoration of the world that we have hope, that sadness and the suffering does not overcome. Today is the day that is the beginning of your day to come. Because today, what do we have? We have hope. Because we have faith in Jesus. Because we have made that baby step towards the cross. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some of the baby steps we take are through our offering. That we do ministry in the world because we believe that those baby steps matter. So if you're watching us online, we have a giving tab on our website that there are many ways to give. And if you're here in our sanctuary, there are offering plates at both the entrance and the other door. Yeah. <laughs>
Hang on just a second. Great day. Yeah. yeah.